what I want to do is I want to I want to share and use the platform that God's given me just to speak into your life a word of encouragement today as you get ready for the Christmas season. We say this all the time. Christmas season comes with awkward conversations. Um, if, if you're like me and you grew up in a split home or or you, you as an adult, you know, you live in a split home. You got to see that ex. Come on, somebody. You got to see baby daddy, baby mommy. You got to see people and you're going to have to sit at Christmas dinner table with some people that, you know, sometimes you just don't see eye to eye on things and you have to smile, <laughs> grin it and bear it, you know. And I just want to encourage you three days before you do all that to give you a little pep talk so that you can get through your Christmas season full of joy and full of peace. Um, when my wife and I um, were in college, we went to Southeastern University over in, in Lakeland, Florida. Um, we took a lot of classes together. Um, as a married couple, we picked some of our, our, our smaller classes together, like history. And uh, I love history. History was probably my favorite subject when I was in school. I loved it because it already happened and I didn't have to figure out what was next. You know what I mean? Like math is like solving problems. History's already there. All you have to do is read about it and understand it and it doesn't change. History's already history. You know what I'm saying? Like it's not a moving target. I feel like math is a moving target and I don't like that. Um, I love history. And uh, so when I went into my freshman year of, of college, I felt like I had a good grasp on history. History was my thing. And uh, my wife and I had a history class together. And well, my wife, God bless her. History, not really her subject. Um, my wife, um, for many reasons, struggled with it. I think it's mostly because she came from a mixture of a first generation Cuban home mixed with homeschooling at the same time. So I don't know what the history was about in the homeschool lessons, but baby, you did a great job. And, and if you remember what we figured out in history class that first semester was we figured out a little cheat code. And I know I have middle schoolers in the room, so I don't endorse anything that I'm about to say. Um, but history was my thing, and my wife would sit next to me. So in history class, uh, we had a, our first big quiz coming up. And I had looked at it, and we saw it was multiple choice, A, B, C, D, and E. A, B, C, D, and E. Five options. And we, we, we worked out a code. When we sat down and I would go to the first problem, if I knew the answer was A, I would tap my thumb on the table, that's A, number one is A. If it was B, two figures, C, three figures, D, four figures, E, five. And this works for about the first six or seven problems. It was a 50 question quiz, and um, we, we got a good percentage of the way through it. And then all of a sudden, um, there came a problem because by the 10th, 15th question, somewhere along the line, all of a sudden, there was an F option, and a G option, and an H, and all of a sudden, there were eight, nine, 10 different letters that could be the correct answer. And so at that point, I'm like, ah, 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 I'm like tapping multiple fingers, two plus two, and I'm trying, and she's just like, uh, I don't know. I aced the test, my wife got it incomplete. Um, it didn't really, it didn't really pan out for her, but I love history. I love history, because history teaches us. In order to know where you're going, you need to know where you came from. In order to know what to expect in the future, lesson one, learn the history. The Bible says that there's no new thing under the sun, meaning history is going to repeat itself. Have you ever noticed that the world flows in cycles? We, we have things go one way, then something happens and it balances back out, and then it goes this way, and then it, and it balances back out. And I remember studying this war, World War I in in my history class. And because I went to a Christian university, of course, they're going to have their little Christian spins on things and little stories that maybe aren't so common inside of the Christmas story. And I want to highlight something that happened during World War One. During World War One, And uh, if you don't know, the World War I, um, it was started over the assassination of one man. And I don't mean to belittle this man's life or the value of his life, but one man's assassination led to the eventual death of 16 to an estimated 20 million people because somebody got frustrated and angry, so somebody lashed out one country, declared war on another. And so this spiral effect of what I'm going to call escalated conflict began. Have you ever been in conflict and things just escalate? And it's like, how did we get here? You know, um, why, why did I throw a grenade? I had a trident. You're going to get that if you're a movie guy, you know. Uh, how, how, you killed a man. What happened? Things gone, have gone too far in World War I. Franz Ferdinand was the Duke of Austria. And Franz Ferdinand was assassinated. And because he was assassinated in the summer of 1914, this act started a global conflict. 
Austria declared war on Serbia as a result of the assassination of Franz Ferdinand. As a result of Austria declaring war on Serbia, Russia declared war on Austria. Well, we're with Serbia, so if you're against Serbia, then we're against you. So Russia declares war on Austria. Then Germany declared war on Russia. And then France, as a result, declared war on Germany. There's a lot of Germanys in here. Germany then declared war on Belgium, and Britain declares war on Germany. And this cycle of escalated conflict begins, and within a matter of really days, just a few weeks, months, this small thing becomes this global epidemic where now conflict has risen into what we know as World War I. And within four years of that war, we know an estimated 16 to 20 million people lost their lives. Escalated conflict. Many people died in this war because of an old war tactic that was popular at the time. It was called trench warfare. If you've ever seen any movies, um, you might have seen something like this where, where they dug out these tunnels and there's a guy with like a musket hanging over the top and he's shooting. And, and this tactic of war is really ineffective because you really can't even see the enemy. You're just shooting at another person who's dug inside of a trench and, and it's blind warfare. And trench warfare, as a result, 16 to 20 million people died, and the object of, French, uh, of, of trench warfare was to hurl ammunition at an enemy you can't really see. They were hurling ammunition at the opposition from their, from their trenches, from the safety of their, of their trenches. And I think if we're honest, as a society today, in our day-to-day -day lives, I think we utilize the tactic of trench warfare in the way we live. I think we, we use social media, <laughs> we hide behind computers, and we lob ammunition at people that we disagree with, right? We watch the news, and the news, at this point, honestly, I've given up. Like, you cannot turn on the news. I don't know who to agree with. As anybody like me, it's like, where, what, is, what is the truth, what is not the truth? And all we see is ammunition being thrown at one side, and then they receive the ammunition, so the other side lobs it back, and all we see is chaos. All we see is conflict everywhere we turn, and then it trickles into our own Facebook pages and our own social media rants, and we're commenting, and then we take it to the Christmas dinner table. Lord help us, if politics, or that X, or whatever it is, theology, Lord, if somebody tries to get me to lead someone to Jesus at the Christmas dinner table one more time in my life, I'm going to lose it, okay? And conflict occurs, and what I've noticed in the world that we live today, in the world that we live in today, it's not okay to disagree with anybody anymore. It's not okay to have a different opinion anymore. If somebody has a different opinion, we can't just agree to disagree. We have to prove the other person wrong at any and all cost. And this is what happened in 1914. There was a disagreement, there was a problem that occurred, and somebody was going to finish the argument. And as a result, 16 to 20 million people lost their lives. Four months into this war, there was a moment, there was a moment that occurred on the very first Christmas Eve of this four year long war. About four months in, during this war, the first Christmas Eve service happened. And we don't know, we know it was either the French, the Germans, or the British because of the location of where the war was taking place. We don't know from what country the first person that made this move came from. We don't know who to give credit to. But at some point during the war, this trench warfare, somebody made a decision to lay down their weapons and they climbed out of the trench and they walked to the middle of the battlefield. And they walked into the middle of the battlefield where everybody could hear and he declared that there would be a truce for this evening. That during Christmas Eve, that we would be at peace with each other and we would declare a unanimous truce across the battle lines. They all agreed to lay down their weapons. And on that night, and we'll have some photos from the actual war footage, on that night, they decided to lay down their arms. History tells us that they told stories to each other. <laughs> they had conversations. For the first time, they looked the enemy of their life in the eyes and had a conversation. How many of you know Whenever there's conflict these days, we never really look at each other anymore. We, we fight in a ghost way through text messages, through, through, through passive aggressive comments, but we really don't look people in the eye anymore and have a conversation about what's happening. And they laid down their weapons and, and, and they came out and they decided to spend Christmas Eve together. And if you'll notice, there's different colors of, uh, uh, of, of uniform here. These are men who the 
day before were hurling ammunition at each other. And on this day, they decided to stop. They decided and agreed to lay down their weapons. On that night, they talked. They told stories. I think we, do we have another picture? I think we have one of them playing games. Austin, do you have the, the next picture? Uh, they were playing, I'm gonna say this is soccer because it's Europe. They're playing games together. These are men who were just at war. They're in the middle of a battle line with trenches drawn on opposite sides. The day before, they were shooting at each other and today they're playing soccer together. On this day, they decided to lay down everything that separated them. And what they ended up finding out is they actually liked each other. <laughs> That after they had conversations and after they broke bread and after they celebrated, they found out that they actually, they liked each other. History records that the commanding officers the next day, the next day had to reassign the men who were stationed there to different areas because they refused to pull the trigger the next day. So this unexpected miracle happens where men who were in this bloody battle where almost 20 million people died as a casualty of war decided after they saw each other face to face and after they realized that they had something in common that they couldn't be on the other end of the trigger anymore and they decided to to cease fighting with the people that they hung out with the night before and so the commanding officers sent them and dispatched them into other areas so that they wouldn't feel the weight of I can't shoot my friend like that's awkward like I can't do this so they read commission them into, into other areas, and they, and they create this rule, the commanding officers created a new rule within the military of no fraternizing with the enemy, no fraternization, and uh, I've heard that in youth group a bunch of times, uh, no fraternizing with the girls, you know what I mean, PDA, pu pu no, no public displays of affection, you know, so, so no more talking to the person you're supposed to be shooting, because what they found is, if they talked, if they had a conversation, they wouldn't fight each other anymore. How crazy is it that today we live in a world where we're just fighting with each other all the time? How many of us, if we're honest, it trickles into almost every relationship that we have? The things that separate us, whether, whether it, it's an ex, whether, whether it, it, it's mom and, and kids, dad and kids, or whether it's Democrat versus Republican, whatever it might be, there's these dividing lines that have now separated us and we can't just look each other in the eye and go, hey, I disagree with you, but give me a hug. I still love you, even though I disagree. I know I'm not that old, I don't think 32, but I, I still remember the 90s. And I remember it was okay to be a Yankee and a Red Sox. That was the only like really crazy like war. If you were a Yankee and a Red Sox, there was no good blood. But that was like, it was sports. It wasn't much anything else. It was, it was Dolphins versus Patriots. Dolphins. It was, yeah, come on somebody. Yes. Yes. Sports was one of the dividing lines. And it was okay because at the end of the day, we all knew, come on, we're family. My dad's family was from the Northeast and my mom's family was from here in Florida. So there was a dividing line in our sports world every holiday season. But now, we've taken the Red Sox-Yankees rivalry into every arena of our lives and we're sitting in trenches and we're throwing ammunition at one another without having a conversation. So history records that they had to reassign them because I've, I've found this, if you deeply love somebody and you, actually, and you actually care for them, you won't let what separates you separate you. Does that make sense? We won't let the things that make us different keep us apart. We'll agree. But they declared this, the Christmas truce of 1914. This is what history records it as. The Christmas truce of, of 1914. And again, I think we see this this in our, in our society today, not maybe in the actions, but in the hearts of Americans, of, of humanity. There's more polarization than ever. Come on, there's, there's more things that separate us, more battle lines, more opinions, more entrenched, I'll say this, ideologies that separate us. And here's what I'll say. Stand for what you believe in, but people are more valuable than your position. People are more valuable than our positions. We can't allow the entrenched thoughts, the, the lines that we've created to keep us from loving humanity. Well, people are beautiful and they're wonderful. Come on, sometimes we gotta be a gold digger, meaning there, there's some gold in everybody, but you gotta dig real deep sometimes to find that gold on them and polish them off to find that little nugget. Okay, they are a good person, even though they, whatever, they voted for whoever. Oh, there's still a, there's a little nugget of gold in there somewhere. There's a little nugget of gold inside of everybody. 
And I think we've thrown too many people, we've thrown our friends, we've thrown our family, we've thrown society out with the bathwater. And in 1914, these men who had far more things that separated them, that brought them together, decided to start the Christmas truce of 1914. I'm exhausted by having to be worried that if I say something, somebody's, I'm gonna lose my relationship with somebody over something I say. Is anybody tired of that? I'm tired of having to guard everything that comes out of my mouth because I can't say anything and I'm not trying to, to go on some, I'm just trying to bring people together. I'm trying to say that it's exhausting in every setting and every, every moment of life to be fearful that I'm gonna say things the wrong way because we can't just agree to disagree anymore. We're going somewhere with all this, I promise. We're going to get to Jesus. <laughs> so therefore, what I want to do as the pastor of Imagine Church, I want to declare the Christmas truths of 2019. I want to declare that this season we're declaring the Christmas truths of 2019. I'm going to declare truths in this season over the lives of husbands and wives. I want to declare truths over moms and daughters, over fathers and sons, over exes and currents, <laughs> over stepdads and stepdaughters. I want to declare a Christmas truce of 2019. One of my responsibilities with this platform is to say things that are sometimes going to offend people. It doesn't come with just fanfare. This, this, this platform gives me a responsibility to say what I believe God wants to be said. And, and today, I communicate this thought with a very heavy heart and a very serious posture because I believe that it's, it's time to end this idea that if we're at opposing ends of, of the spectrum that we can't let love be at the center. And that we should let love propel us and push us into unity with each other. I'm done fighting about marriage, family, politics, sports, whatever you name it. And trust me, I'm a super competitive guy, so that's hard for me to say. If you came to Friendsgiving football, we played a little backyard turkey ball, it got a little crazy. I got accused of punching someone. I believe some of the women told a, told a false story, and I got accused of punching somebody. I don't know. It got a little, got a little carried away. Something in our hearts has just gone too far. Something inside of us as a society has just gone too far. So how do we do this then? How do we... How do we come back together? How do we have unity? How does this happen? Well, I'm going to give you a few just little nuggets, and, and then I'm going to wrap this up. Number one, somebody has to take the first step. In the Christmas truce of 1914, we don't know which country the young man came from, but somebody had to, to take his rifle, set it down, and, and take the crazy first step out of a trench not knowing if he's going to be gunned down by the people around him. And he stepped into the middle of the battlefield, and he declared, enough. It's enough. I'm done fighting. I'm done with this. It's Christmas Eve, folks. What are we doing? Somebody has to take the first step. And what's funny is no one ever takes the first step because we all think we're right. <laughs> well, I'm just waiting for her to take the first step because I'm right. I'm not taking the first step because they're the one that did it. I didn't do it. Have you ever heard the story of the husband and wife who disagreed so they played the silent game with each other? Husband and wife, they disagreed and they play the silent game. If you're not married, this is when we get mad at each other and we don't look at each other, but we kind of look at each other, um, but we don't. And we breathe through a lot. <sighs> you know, you, you toss in bed real hard and the other person's like, what? And you're like, no, you did this. Nobody deals with that. I'm just the payments, just the payments. Well, this husband and wife, they were in an argument, and, 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 and they were playing the silent game with each other. So this husband, he had a flight at 5 o'clock in the morning the next day. He had to leave for his flight at 5 a.m. So he left a note on, on his wife's side of the bed. Hey, wake me up at 4. I have to catch a flight. Well, he woke up at 9 a.m. furious because he missed his flight until he found the note next to his bed that said, Hey, it's 4 a.m. Time to get up. Uh, you know, nobody wins. Nobody wins when we're waiting for the other person to take the first step. <laughs> I take it we played the silent game a time or two. Somebody has to take the first step. Somebody has to. And I'll just say this. Why not the people of God? Why not Christians who love and peace and unity and acceptance is supposed to be at the core of our theology and our ideology? 
Jesus didn't come to hurt people and, 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 and to cause people to hate one another. Jesus came to give a unifying message that would bring everybody together that says, I love all of you. Jesus stood on a stage before all of Jerusalem with, with Barabbas on the stage, a murderer, and Jesus allowed this terrible trial and jury for, for the community and the people to free a murderer and crucify Jesus. And I believe he stood there going, I love Barabbas. Let him go. Because Jesus said, even though he's done things that separate me from him, I love him. So I'm not going to seek some sort of retribution. I'm just going to seek reconciliation and allow his account to be zero and let him go. Jesus came to bring us together, not to drive us apart. The only thing that should drive us apart is our overwhelming love for everybody. <laughs> that should be the thing. People should look at us and go, I'm just, they just, just love everybody. <laughs> they need to preach some truth up in there. They, are, they just tell everybody that they're loved and they're accepted and, and, and they're just it's a false gospel. It's just wrong. They just give everyone hugs. You should not hug people you disagree with. What? Come on, I think if we're honest, we've all been a part of churches and services and moments and generations where that was the reality. I'm tired of it. Somebody has to take the first step. Then we have to be willing to drop our weapons. I have to be willing to let go of the thing that, that I just can't get past with that person. And I have to say, you know what? I'm going to let it go. I'm going to drop my weapons. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop the fact that I got this on them. Come on. Nothing makes you happier than when you get something on somebody. You know what I'm talking about? When you get some information, you get some dirt, you can't wait to see them be like, oh, I'm glad you brought that up. Let's talk about your taxes. Mm -hmm. We got the same CPA, and I heard you cheated on your taxes, man of God. You know, it's like, what? We love getting dirt on each other so that we can pull up that ammunition and fire at each other. We have to drop our weapons, our ideologies. People are more important than our positions. And then thirdly, we have to focus on what unites us. We have to focus on what unites us. We have to focus on this. My thing's telling me wrap it up, buddy. We have to focus on what unites us. In this moment in 1914, it was Christmas Eve. It was the Christmas season. The one thing out of the millions they were against each other for, the one thing that brought them together. If we can find something that unites us, then we can leave change this morning. We can leave change in our relationships. If we can find one thing, all this soldier needed was one thing, Christmas, Jesus. I grew up going to Bible, Bible school and I went to church when I was a kid and, and, and I know we all did, Germans, Brits. French, we all do. We got this one thing that unites us in all the chaos. And I believe if we can do those three things, then we can leave change today. We can leave change and, and head into Christmas with hearts full of hope that we can have peace. We can move forward into 2020 with our weapons laid down and our agendas and our ideologies laid down and embrace any and everybody that's in our life, no matter how separated we might be. Something in our heart changes when we allow God to get involved. If you will allow God to get involved in your heart and your soul and your spirit today, something will begin to change in your life. You know, in a lot of Christmas songs, we hear the word peace, peace on earth, the mercy mile, you know, all we hear peace over and over inside of Christmas songs. And peace, I don't know if it's something we can actually, you know, Miss America 2020 or 2019 just came or whatever it was. And, you know, if you remember the old joke from when I know when I was a teenager, I just want world peace. You know, that was the thing. They go, it's world peace. What is your mission as Miss America? World peace. I don't know that we can ever just bring conflict to an end and stop and just bring peace externally, but I do believe we can have peace internally. I don't know that we'll ever get to the place where people stop fighting each other, but I believe I can get a place in my heart where I stop fighting, where I lay down my weapons. This is the peace that God brings. And the reason the world can never get there, I believe, is because we don't seek to do things God's way. We seek this. We seek resolution or conflict resolution. And, and, and the simple definition of conflict resolution is fight about it till you figure out which one's wrong. And then when you figure out who's wrong, you beat them up until they realize how wrong they are. The only problem with that is marriages fall apart over things like that. There is never a resolution because there's a winner and a loser in conflict resolution. Somebody wins and somebody loses and the winner goes all the spoils and the loser gets coal in their stockings, you know? There's... 
Res conflict resolution isn't the way God does things. Peace God's way isn't via reconciliation where there's a winner and a, and a loser. Peace God's way is called reconciliation. Reconciliation is what, is what God brings. The difference between a winner and a loser and reconciliation is this. The definition of reconciliation is to bring back together by bringing the balance to zero. I'll say it like this. To bring, to bring the balance between two warring parties, two opposing things, to zero. Not to seek a resolution, but to say, you know what? I'm emptying out the account. Is that zero? You don't owe me anything. You don't owe me to agree with me. I'm gonna bring the account to zero. My wife does most of our finances in the house, so I actually had to study what a bank reconciliation slip was. Um, apparently, the bank sends us statements on, on the different transactions that we've had. Come on, we're my, we're my numbers, people. You love things like this. Right now, you're just like, oh, I wanna get my, my bank account on my computer right now and just crunch numbers. Not me. I don't want to know what's in the bank account, Jesus. Um, I live by faith, not by sight. Come on, somebody. I don't even want the passwords. And ask me if I want a thumbprint all the time. Would you like to thumbprint the password to your Chase bank account? Like, no! No, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Um, and you get, a, you get a reconciliation slip, and the bank tells you what your transactions were. Then you get your little your bank ledger out um, from your checkbook. I've never touched a checkbook, but apparently there's this thing called a checkbook, and you compare transactions, and the mission is to, is to cross out until the balance comes to zero, where what they believe you've spent is what you know you've spent, and you bring the reconciliation down to zero. I believe God wants to do this in each of our lives. God doesn't want to bring you through a process of resolution in your soul today. He doesn't want to go, let's talk about 1992, right? 1992 was rough for you, first of all. We're going to have a five-hour conversation, and until you admit that what you did in 1992 was wrong and you paid the price for it, I can't forgive you. Now, let's bring up 2005. Remember that when that Beyonce song came out? You got crazy, girl. Okay, let's talk about when that Beyonce song dropped you. went wild. Let's talk about that for five hours, and we'll find some sort of retribution, a price you have to pay. It's not how God does things. God is into reconciliation where he looks at everything that you've done throughout the course of your life and he brings the balance to zero. And he gives you a clean slate. And he takes everything that you've ever done and he just wipes it away in one stroke. And he doesn't say, you owe me. You're gonna have to make up for that. You're gonna, you're gonna, have, to, you're gonna have to pay a price. No, he just says, your account's zeroed out. You don't owe me anything. You don't owe me. You don't owe me anything. Ephesians 2, 14 through 16 says this. It says, for Christ himself brought peace to us, therefore we can have peace. Christ himself brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people, meaning you can take the word Jews and Gentiles and make it Republicans, Democrats, excess courage. You can take whatever it is, whatever separates, whatever two people groups are separated today. He will take you and them, the Bible says, and he will unite them into one people. In his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Jesus has already given us the ability to allow peace to reign in our hearts by in his own power breaking down the walls of hostility in our lives. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations and he made peace between Jews and Gentiles. Republicans and Democrats, currents and exes, baby mamas, baby daddies, by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ, here's the word, reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility towards each other was put to death. Reconciliation comes through Jesus. Reconciliation where I can look at somebody, come on, I'm just gonna be honest with you, it's really hard to look at some people who have hurt me in my life. It's hard. Without God, their account's not at zero. Without God, they still owe me. But because God has given me the strength to know that he's reconciled me, therefore now I can reconcile with others. I can look at people who have hurt me deeply and love them fully. Because I'm perfect. Oh my gosh, talk to my wife for 30 seconds. I am not perfect. I had a tantrum yesterday, okay? Like, tantrum. I messed up. I'm not perfect. Through Jesus, God brings our balance to zero. Second Corinthians says it like this. All this is from God. Again, who reconciled 
us to himself through Christ and gave us, check this out, once God reconciles you and him, he makes your account zero, he says that he now gives you the ministry of reconciliation. Now you have, as you've been reconciled to God and your account is zero, now he's given you the ministry of reconciliation so that God was reconciled the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and has committed us to the message of reconciliation. Therefore, what is God saying? What is the Bible saying? Once he's reconciled you, it's your responsibility to reconcile with others. We don't just get to be bitter and angry and frustrated and lash out at every person who hurts us anymore. God has forgiven us of so much. If you've come to know Jesus, you know. Come on, let's be honest. There's dark moments. I got dark moments where I don't like myself, where I'm ugly inside where the thoughts that I have are not who I am. Paul says, why do I always do the things that I don't wanna do? Why am I continually the man I don't wanna be? Thank you, God, that you've reconciled me. And it's not on me anymore. You continue to bring my account to zero. No matter how far I run, I can come back to you and you reconcile me over and over. Therefore, because I know my darkest moments and I know the thoughts that I have and I know how I think about people and I know what I say about people. Therefore, because my darkest moments have been reconciled, I now have the capacity and ability to reconcile with others. To look somebody else in the eye and go, you don't owe me anything. Forgiving and moving past and allowing there to be peace in my heart does not come easy. It comes because of Jesus. I can wake up every day and have peace in my soul and know I'm going to be okay and there's hope for tomorrow because my peace isn't circumstantial. It's on God. Come on, that's messy. That's difficult. And I don't just say that flippantly. I know we all have stories in this room. But I want you to know that in this season, God came to earth to bring peace and to reconcile you and to reconcile you with everybody else. We're reconciled and it's hard, you're right, unless God is working in your life. It's a miracle what happened on that battlefield in 1914. There's a key part of our mission at Imagine. Victoria, you can get ready to come. We're young, we're new church, but I'll say this forevermore. What I don't wanna invite you to if it's your first time here or you've been coming, I don't wanna invite you to come every once in a while. I don't want you to come just when we're doing a series that sounds good or, or what, what was the first, somebody used it the other day, um, Easter, Christmas, it was like an acronym, it was like ECO, or an ECO, church attender, I don't know, I forget what it was, Easter, Christmas, I don't know, CEO, CEO Christmas, Easter, what? huh, only. only, okay, here's, here's what I know, God wants to process with you, we don't want you to just come every once in a while, you're not going to get anywhere. I don't know how many times I've watched my parents start to stop smoking. <laughs> like, start and stop, start and stop, start and stop, start and stop. They never committed to the process. And I believe God wants to bring you from a moment of just reconciliation with him and you and process with you to change your heart so that you can have reconciliation with everybody. But that's a process. That does not come easy. It doesn't come in just a moment. Oh, you're saved. Oh, just forgiveness is flooding my soul. And I just walk around forgiving everybody who's hurt me. You're crazy. <laughs> like, it's a process. And what I want to say here is this, to make a guarantee to you, I believe it takes probably a little bit less than a year if you commit to the process to allow God to really start changing your life. But I'll say this, if you give us a year of your life at Imagine Church, I want you to see what God can do. I guarantee you in a year, if you commit, if you get involved, if you go through our next steps process, if you walk out your freedom, if you commit to being a part and that just doesn't mean being a faithful seat filler. There's men and women here who lay down their life on a weekly basis to make this church happen. And when we get involved in God's plan, he processes with us. And so it's an invitation to say, hey, I wanna, I'll make this church home. If you got a home church, beautiful, wonderful. Go there, support it, lift your pastor's arms. I was watching, no, nah, never mind, I can't give any Star Wars spill spoilers. I was almost going to, forgive me. I don't need reconciliation right now with everybody. And here's what I'll say to you. If you allow God to make your balance zero today, and then you commit your life to the process, I believe that if you finish 2019 like that, then 2020, I declare, can be a year of reconciliation. 20 can be a year of reconciliation in your life. Uh, the Christmas truce of 1914, World War I, it's all a type and shadow of, of God's story for humanity. And then the very first Christmas, 
we look at the story in the nativity and we go, oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> the cute little donkeys. It was just, it's a beautiful little town with air conditioning and it was just awesome. The Christmas lights were really popping that year in Bethlehem. No, it wasn't. Israel was at war. They were under Roman rule. Rome had their thumb pressed down into Jerusalem, pressed down into the Jewish society. And King Herod was at war with Pontius Pilate, who was the governor of the area. They were at war with each other. And Rome and Jerusalem were at war with each other. Humanity was at war with each other. And then enter Jesus. And Jesus left heaven. And Jesus came to earth. And then an angel steps forward. And this is what the angel says in Luke 2. It says, but an angel said to these shepherds, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you that you will find a baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angels, praising God and saying in here, glory to God in the highest in heaven and on earth peace. How? He says, to those on whom his favor rests. You can have peace today if you allow the favor of God to rest on your life. You can have peace today if you'll submit to God's process. Does that mean I have to do a bunch of Hail Marys or, you know, throw away my truck? What? No. God wants to process with you. We're here to help. That's what we do. We're not here to pound you into the head with some theology. We're here to say, hey, we're all figuring this out. Do you want to figure it out with us? Because we're just trying to look like Jesus. Here's the point. I don't want you just to attend a service and feel good and then go home and allow your soul to continue to eat away. I don't want you to attend. I want you to experience. God can be experienced. And he'll enter your life and he'll change things and he'll rearrange and he'll bring you back to your original creation the way he wants you to be. Don't just attend experience. If a moment in 1914 could change the lives of men who hated each other, then why not now? Why can't we make a decision in Christmas of 2019 to declare a truce with our soul and the people around us? Charles Wesley wrote the famous Christmas carol, and he said it like this, and I think it's so true for this moment. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I just decree peace over marriages, peace over homes, peace over families, peace over dads and sons, mothers and daughters, exes and currents. I declare in this Christmas season that peace would be ours. In the name of Jesus, I thank you for it. Lord, I declare peace over our nation. I declare that the people of God would rise up and be loving and kind and seek the middle ground to declare truth that we can disagree but not post hateful things on Facebook. We don't need to do that. It destroys our message to love. If I can't hug somebody, if I can't look them in the eye, I'm not going to tell them anything I wouldn't say to them online. I won't do it anymore, Jesus. For our community, for Tampa Bay, I pray that this little church would start a movement of God love for every person. And that Tampa Bay as a result would, be, would receive the peaceful spirit of God, would, release love, would receive love and joy and acceptance and peace in their souls. I declare it. Would you move in our hearts and would you encourage people to get involved in your process, to make a decision today, to, to start the journey and now with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're in the room and you say, Pastor Shad, I'm not reconciled with God. It's been a long time or it's never happened. But you're feeling something inside you going, I'm tired of the shame. I'm tired of the anger. I'm tired of the frustration. I'm tired of the bitterness. I'm tired of it. I want to let it go. If I can be reconciled, please, somebody, help me be reconciled. God wants that for you today. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you feel that prompting to say, Pastor Shad, today... I want to be reconciled to God and I, I, I want to be forgiven. I want to start this journey. What I'd love to invite you to do is, is to pray a, a prayer of forgiveness with me.
to ask God to forgive us and reconcile us. And in one moment, the Bible says, if we declare with our mouth and believe in our hearts that God is well, then we are saved. There's a process. Post that prayer. But it starts in a moment. If that's you, it'd be the honor of my life and the first Christmas service we ever put on here at Ben Hill. There will be many more to come. If you would, if that's you and you, you'd be willing, would you just slip your hand up right where you are and say, I want to be reconciled today with God. I want to be reconciled. Nobody's looking at you. It's just me. Just because I love you and I want, to, I want to know that it's you. I see. I see the hands. I see you. Let's do this. If you're a believer in the house and you just lifted your hand with every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to say a prayer and I want to ask everybody that believes that and wants to receive that to pray this prayer with me. Let's start like this. Jesus, this morning, as we celebrate your birth, I want to be reconciled. I want forgiveness. I want to be able to reconcile with everyone around me. To let peace flood my soul. To let joy be my demeanor. To let, to let the love of God be my expression. So today, would you forgive me? I admit to you that I've done some wrong things. Would you wipe it away? Would you bring my balance back to zero? Thank you, God, that you came to earth to know me and to allow me to know you. Forgive me. In Jesus' name, amen.